Welcome to our presentation from the University of Oregon. This is Rebooting the Past, Uploading the Future, Web 2.0, and the Study of History Through a Living Learning Community. I want to thank Joan Lippincott, who uh, heard us give this presentation at the Educause Learning Initiative meeting in Austin in January and, and really enjoyed it and encouraged us to come and, and uh, repeat the presentation here uh, at CNI. So we're, we're very happy to be here. Let me introduce our panel. Uh, first, I'm Andrew Bonamici. I'm Associate University Librarian for Media and Instructional Services. I've been at the University of Oregon uh, working in the library system in, uh, since 1985, and I've worked in a number of capacities in library ad in administration and educational technology leadership. Um, Heather Briston, on my right, is the Corrigan Solari University Historian and Archivist. Uh, that's an endowed chair. Um, Heather's been at the U of O since 2001 and is a very active instructor and collaborator with faculty who integrate in archival content and primary sources into their instruction and research. Kevin Hatfield is Assistant Director of Academic Initiatives in Residence Life and Adjunct Assistant Professor of History at the University of Oregon. Uh, Kevin's been a real pioneer in adopting distributed education technologies to teach students in Bend. Uh, we have a Central Oregon uh, presence there. And he's an active partner with the libraries in many instructional and outreach projects. And our last panelist is Matt Villeneuve. Uh, Matt is a, a sophomore at the U of O. He's a freshman interest group teaching assistant, or FA, in the uh, first year programs. Um, he's a sophomore from Seattle, Washington, and he spent his two years at Oregon as a history major. Um, in his capacity as an FA, he lives in the residence halls, uh, works as a teacher, advisor, and mentor for first-year students. And you'll hear um, more details about that as the, um, the presentation moves along. So um, let me do a quick show of hands. I have to do what Cliff did in the last presentation and, and shade my eyes a little bit, but how many of you are librarians? Um, any uh, academic technology administrators? You can raise your hand more than, more than once. <laughs> many of us have to do that these days. Um, archivists, digital library developers, um, any, any other uh, roles and responsibilities, uh, you know, feel free. Well, maybe in the Q&A, uh, you can share who you are um, in, into the microphone. So let me, uh, I'll start off by telling you a little bit about the University of Oregon. Uh, so the University of Oregon is in Eugene. We're 100 miles south of Portland, um, established in 1876. We're a comprehensive research university with eight schools and colleges, uh, arts and sciences, a graduate school, uh, professional schools in architecture and allied arts, business, education, journalism, um, music and dance, and law. Um, so in addition to our Eugene campus, we have teaching and research facilities in Portland, in Bend, and uh, Marine Research Institute in Charleston on the Oregon coast. The total enrollment, uh, fall 2009, is 22,300. Um, our undergraduate enrollment is a little over 18,000. We are the smallest of the public university members of the association of, of the uh, AAU. Um, and we actually like this scale. It, it's a small uh, university. Um, it allows us to develop a cohesive uh, campus community, but it's still large enough for significant research initiatives. Um, Oregon historically um, has struggled with finances. We've had a, uh, many extractive industries like logging uh, through the years. There, there have been boom and bust cycles in the economy. Um, there's also a streak of Western self-reliance and pulling pulling together as, as a community. So uh, we, we think we've also learned how to collaborate uh, very quickly and, and look around uh, at our neighbors on campus for help when we, when we need it, because we, we know that there are a lot of things we just couldn't do by ourselves. Um, if you want to, uh, let's talk about some of the goals of undergraduate education. So we have a new academic plan uh, that was ratified um, 2008, 
And the goals of undergraduate education as expressed in that plan are to question critically, communicate clearly, act creatively, live ethically, um, you know, nothing really radical about those. Um, but we're, we also see it as important to provide our undergraduate students uh, to conduct, with opportunities to conduct original research and engage in significant learning, service learning projects. Uh, this reflects our role as a research university as well as a, a liberal arts institution that's providing a really solid undergraduate education. So why is this kind of um, collaboration and this uh, fostering of, of scholarship so important? Well, first, it's the right thing to do. I mean, this is higher education. Um, the U of O being a research university, we do feel very strongly that we want our students to become scholars. Um, and we want to uh, distinguish ourselves. Uh, only 8.5% of the UO's budget comes from the state general fund at this point in time. So we're highly tuition dependent. Uh, so we want to focus on recruiting and retaining strong, you know, successful students, and we're doing that by increasing scholarships and financial aid, improving residence halls, um, and developing partnerships like this one that help to foster academic engagement uh, and success in the classroom and beyond. So we're trying to create that continuum of student experience that, uh, that starts in the dorms, uh, you know, extends into informal learning spaces, the classroom itself, um, and into, into the, the student's social life and their role in the community. So in the libraries, we've made some very conscious decisions to um, uh, enhance our support of undergraduate learning. Uh, we've uh, built out a service, uh, learning commons service model. Uh, we've established a new position to coordinate instruction and campus partnerships. Uh, we're staying open around the clock for much of the year. Um, that's actually an, an initiative that's funded by the student government. The, uh, the associated students of the University of Oregon are, are paying for a good chunk of our extended hours. Uh, and we're actively participating in first-year instructional programs and academic initiatives like this one that get students off to a very good start. So what you'll hear about today is how this all comes together in a single class. Uh, a residential FIG, uh, FIG is a freshman um, interest group uh, for first-year students who live together in a designated hall. So to, uh, to describe that program, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Okay, thank you, Andrew. So. I'm just going to spend a few moments describing what I believe is a fairly unique learning environment, not only at the University of Oregon, but compared to some of our uh, fellow institutions, and, and that's our freshman interest group program. And at the U of O, a FIG co-enrolls 25 first-year students in two general education courses during the fall term uh, that satisfy kind of core baccalaureate graduation requirements. And those larger courses are typically lower division, large lecture surveys that are open to, to non-FIG participants as well. So essentially we're drawing small cohorts of 25 students out of those two larger courses. And then that cohort is linked together by a one credit college connection seminar. And these seminars have a discipline specific prefix. They all have a unique title that reflect the intersections they're trying to make between those two core courses. Uh, the fig that we're gonna talk about today is called Hidden History and it links an introduction to world history with an introduction to folklore course. The residential FIG program at the University of Oregon has another layer to community development, and that is that the students are not only co-enrolled in those three courses, but they also live together in the same residence hall. Uh, by design, they're not roommates. We don't want to over-homogenize or narrow that community, uh, but they certainly do live in a residence hall, and Matt can elaborate on his role both in and outside the classroom as an undergraduate teaching assistant for the FIG. Uh, at the University of Oregon, we have, heading into fall 2010, 23 residential FIGs and 40 non-res FIGs, so about 63 FIGs overall. And so a majority of our first-year students have this experience of kind of transitioning to college within an academic context. The goal, kind of the objectives behind the freshman interest group program is to foster interdisciplinary thought and inquiry 
uh, between those two core courses and hopefully help first year students start to discern both content and methodological intersections uh, between the core subjects. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last several years with history and folklore. Uh, they, we also hope that the FIGS can enrich the investigation of the essential questions of the disciplines and again reinforce at an early point in their undergraduate career disciplinary thinking, practices, and habits of mind. Uh, the students enrolled in a residential FIG, as I mentioned, have kind of a dual peer community that exists both inside and outside the classroom. Uh, not only do the students live in a residence hall, but the course itself is taught in the Living Learning Center, which is one of our newer residence halls on campus that has public access on the first floor for classrooms and, and various spaces for students and faculty to interact outside of class. And I would submit that one of our primary student development objectives for the first year uh, program is to try to shift gradually students from s solely course-based interaction with their faculty, so approaching professors to talk about a particular paper or an exam, to mentoring relationships where you start to see the kinds of conversations about their major, their discipline, uh, career paths, graduate school, letters of recommendation, and so students are being connected early on with someone who is more of a faculty mentor. And Matt, again, as an FA, really can model Model that for the first year students as a student uh, within the, the program. I also want to emphasize that our FIG program at the University of Oregon is not that one credit course I mentioned that links the two core courses together. That seminar is not a disembodied kind of study skills workshop. Uh, or kind of a quotidian welcome or transition to college 101 class. In fact, each of those uh, seminars is really co-constructed and co-instructed by the faculty member and the FA. And a tremendous amount of thought goes into the selection of the FAs, their pairing with faculty members, and creating a unique experience where each of those seminars will follow a term-long project-based inquiry exercise. And so it's, it's not a course that meets simply to kind of hold the hand of first year students, but it really is, as I mentioned, a way for students to transition within an academic context and, and making those disciplinary connections. I, one other thing I just want to mention briefly, and Matt can elaborate on this, but the role of the FA, I would submit, is very unique at the University of Oregon. They, they really do function as peer educators or peer mentors, and in many ways model for students what does it mean to be a learner um, at a research university. In other words, that their tuition is paying for more than simply a seat in the classroom or access to faculty office hours, but in fact, at a university, you're becoming part of an academic and a scholarly community. And you can engage in the kind of life of the mind that occurs outside the classroom, whether that be a work in progress talk, uh, an exhibit opening at a museum, uh, a visiting scholars public talk. And, and Matt, as a student who isn't too far removed from the first year students, can kind of of escort and help mentor them. So what does that look like if you're really kind of engaging a life of the mind at a university? And so again, uh, Matt's role is not relegated to performing perfunctory tasks of you know, tabulating attendance or uh, recording scores. He's is sometimes moderating dialogue in the classroom, delivering a presentation, um, assisting me with kind of classroom management and the dynamics that certainly can sometimes be challenging. Uh, for those of you who've read about uh, first year uh, interest programs, one of the challenges challenges that's often faced is that these communities are relatively homogenous and narrowed. And the problem can be that there aren't upper class students participating in the classroom environment. There was a very good uh, Chronicle of Higher Education article written in 2004 uh, by David Jaffe uh, from the University of North Florida looking at some of the divisive and sometimes disruptive behaviors that can develop within uh, a small FIG model such as the one we have. But I have found at the University of Oregon that having MAT and not all FIG programs have an FA. Sometimes it's, it's just the instructors that are teaching the class that the role the FAs play can really mitigate and, and mediate some of those problems that um, might kind of harden into kind of a group think and create perhaps more of an adversarial relationship between the students and the professor. I've not experienced that as an instructor in the program and from what I've heard from my peers they haven't either. And so I, I think the, the FA is pivotal in many ways and that's hoping that those small communities remain very cohesive and don't have some of the potentially negative divisive elements that sometimes instructors have encountered in programs where there's not an FA. Before we get to the course that we're going to speak of at hand, this in many cases started way back in 2006 
when I co-taught a course, a writing 399, so an upper division writing course entitled The New Research, which took primary sources as their input with the idea of having new media be the output. We had a wiki for class discussions and work and because the students did not like the course management software, so we decided to go off the, uh, off the range in that sense. And then we also gave the students an opportunity to do something other than just a traditional research paper for what was generally uh, considered a traditional research class. And uh, we did allow them to do a paper if they wanted to, but we also encouraged them to um, instead create um, involved uh, PowerPoint presentations that could explore their research, create a research blog, or create a proposal for an exhibit to be displayed within the library. At the end of the class, we ended up with, it was a small class of just seven students, and we ended up with three PowerPoints, three papers, and one exhibit proposal. The course itself was uh, co-taught with a professor in the English department. And in the end, we were, we were not as pleased with the fact that we didn't have as many people trying blogs or trying alternatives. But at the same time, we were pleased that not everybody wrote a research paper. Significant in that class, however, was one of the students. His name is, was Connor Ross. And he was interested in researching student life on an issue and doing a comparison. He was interested in comparing the university uh, during World War I versus, um, at that time, the uh, new uh, war in Iraq and what the student life was like. All I had to direct him to was a diary of a student from 1915. Her name was uh, Lucille Saunders. Uh, and I had to explain to him that student life was not well documented from the student point of view. I had plenty of administrative papers and I had the life of the university from the administrative and faculty perspective, but unfortunately not as much from the students. In uh, 1980, we ceased in putting together a yearbook for the university. And there had been no real way of systematically documenting a cohort that on average leaves every four to five years and uh, continually, annually turn up, turns over. We do have a student paper, but ask any student at the U of O and they will say that while that is a student voice, it's not necessarily their voice. So um, when, uh, when Connor was presented with this challenge, instead of, instead of going off and doing nothing, he instead decided to take this challenge and his opportunity as a uh, FIG FA to come up with an idea to have freshman journaling, which then gets uh, saved and preserved in the university archives. And so that's where we come to the origins of hidden history. So this is what we're kind of referring to as the analog era. The first two or three years we taught the class, as Heather mentioned, working with Connor, we had Lucille Saunders' diary and some correspondence between Lucille and her mother and her sister. And we use this uh, to really approach three, what I would consider to be central learning challenges within the discipline of history. And the first one uh, that's encountered by many students arriving at the university is improving historical thinking and inquiry skills. And in this class, and, and Connor was instrumental in helping us conceptualize kind of the pedagogy of the class, we deliberately invited the students to enter the FIG within the framework of an apprenticeship within the historian's craft. And the learning environment then would allow students to actually learn how to practice history as opposed to simply learning an arbitrary body of information. The challenge that we encounter with many first year students is that the experiences they've often had, not always, but they've often had as learners of history before arriving at the university has conditioned them to become very passive kind of passive receivers of information with a singular focus on the mastery of content knowledge, often largely through the rote kind of memorization and recitation of factual information. And so we very quickly wanted to kind of shift and reorient students in terms of how they were thinking about learning history as a discipline. And the diary provided a platform to do that. 
Uh, we also hoped that the diary would allow us to introduce students to the concept of historiography. Again, uh, I would submit uh, historiography is a critical framework uh, that students of history should have in their cognitive toolbox long before uh, they take a methodology sequence as master's students, but unfortunately histori historiography is something that many students have not encountered. And so to try to demystify this notion uh, of how historians ply their craft, we were able to use the diary and have students working in small groups or individually pose a common set of questions to that primary source uh, and then begin to assign meaning and interpret the experiences of Lucille as a first year student. And very quickly, when these groups reconvened, they can discern a, a divergence in, 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 of interpretations or divergence in narratives, the kind of secondary sources that they're writing. And very quickly, they could start to discern that methodology and perspective plays a significant role in the reconstruction of the past. And so we're very intentional about engaging the diary critically. It wasn't about giving them an exam on the content of the diary. Uh, and some, some groups started to tease out that, well, we were much more wedded kind of empirically to this primary source and kind of citing facts where there were other groups that perhaps were a bit more inferential in their reasoning or they perhaps weighed evidence differently based on what they considered to be its, its bias or its completeness or its accuracy. And so we had students kind of working through, again, that notion of what it meant to be a historian and what some of the tools are that historians use. The challenge for many of our students is that they can probably all recall the scientific method chart on their biology instructor's wall in high school and they can remember performing empirical experiments in the laboratory, in the field, testing a hypothesis, analyzing that data. Uh, the challenge is there's often no analog to that in their history class. There probably wasn't a historical methods or historical inquiry thinking chart on the wall. And so some students have had an opportunity to maybe visit a local archive or a museum, perhaps perform oral history, but often there are many students who just have not had an opportunity to work with the raw material of history, to pose a hypothesis or to pose questions to primary sources and begin to interpret those and actually do the work of a historian. So that was the second goal, is introducing them to historiography. And then the third, and this is something we'll all talk more about, is we were hoping that we could frame academic writing as a process of disciplinary thinking. Uh, again, by structuring the kind of writing they were doing, critical thinking and writing around a freshman journaling project. And so this was really the core pedagogy of the class. Students would be at one moment working as historians interpreting Lucille's diary and her correspondence, while concurrently they would be thinking about self-representation and the authoring or the creation of their own primary source materials through their weekly journaling projects. And so kind of keeping in mind what it meant to interpret a historical actor and what it meant to be a living historical actor, kind of in an autobiographical way, recording your experience and being intentional about, so what am I including, what am I not including, how am I constructing narrative? And so those questions, I think, in a reciprocity worked really well. And so that was our goal the first two or three years of the program, again, before we started to introduce any of the new social media. Well, this is actually where uh, I got involved in this story, in this process. I'm Matt, I'm a sophomore at the University of Oregon, I'm a history major, um, which seems like something I need to introduce is whenever I introduce myself. And I'm Matt Villeneuve, I'm a history major. Um, and I'm also a residential FA, um, and I can confidently say that I, I think I have the best job on campus, um, all due respect to your work. Um, as, a as a residential FA, I live in the dorms uh, with my students. And I teach the College Connections course alongside Kevin. Um, and my role is really is threefold. Um, I'm, a, I'm a mentor, a teacher, and an advisor. Um, and as an undergraduate, there's really no other experience like that on campus. Um, it's unique, uh, it's challenging, but it's very rewarding. Um, and I was hired as an FA a little over a year ago, so this is actually the first year that I've done this. Um, and the powers that be connected me with Kevin and uh, the FIG Hidden History. And uh, the theme of Hidden History, as we talked a little bit about, was uh, really centered around preserving student life. And um, Lucille's journal and, uh, and student journals really represent the best documentation methods um, of the past. Um, you know, I think about how Lucille busted out her journal um, on a typewriter back in 1915. Um, using the same kind of keyboard that we, we use, my students use, and I, um, on our laptops every, every week to chronicle um, our experience. And the result of that um, really is the same. It's a, it's a stack of typed papers which are turned in um, to class. 
And so my, my interest really lies in how technology, um, how, how it might affect the production and the study of history. Um, so when I sat down with Kevin for the first time um, to put together our 10-week syllabus for this One Credit College Connections course, um, I pitched this idea. Uh, instead of just journaling every week um, and having students turn in those hard copies to us, um, for us to read and that would be essentially it, um, and then ultimately that whole stack of papers would go um, in a box to Heather in the university archives um, in special collections, why not allow students to actually use the new media um, that they really use in their everyday lives um, to document their experience as, a, as a first year students on campus. Um, and so this notion, which uh, Kevin, I'm thankful to say, immediately endorsed, um, raised some really interesting questions. Um, in the past, in history, Letters, memoirs, journals, those are the types of things that served um, as the best primary sources for historians. But they're not the mediums that I use to communicate in my life. You know, I think about, I have my cell phone and I have my Zoom and, you know, I'm texting and I have, you know, of course, use the phone, email. I only use email for business. That's not something I use socially. That's what the, excuse me, the old people use. Um, but that really, I was beginning to think about, we, we, we've talked about this, all four of us, is how does that, how's that going to change the way that historians um, do their craft. Um, and so this really answers some dynamic questions. Um, how do historians of tomorrow uh, access the experiences that are recorded today using new media? Um, you know, I, I publish Facebook status updates pretty regularly um, instead of writing a journal every day, but those aren't really recorded, they're not kept. Um, I don't use Twitter. Where do those things go? In the ether, the, in the cloud, I don't, you know, I don't record them. So that's, that's an interesting question. Um, additionally, how does, how does really using a textbook um, confine students to a certain uh, perception of what history is about? Uh, we have a fascinating national dialogue due to the new uh, Texas uh, textbook curriculum requirements, which uh, has, has been a great example to talk about what textbooks do to in, you know, affect history as a student. Um, and also, if the future of primary sources and, and thus history itself is in new media, how do we use technology to, uh, to leverage the most effective student learning? Um, and so we came up with a strategic map to try and answer and address some of these questions. And so Kevin and I decided that the best way to explore um, the issues with our students was to ask the questions using technology. Um, and so this is a strategic map that we kind of uh, developed for hidden history and we adopted a kind of a three-pronged approach. Um, we used a wiki as an administrative platform for dialogue and discussion, which would kind of serve as our digital learning space. Um, we also had a WordPress blog for student publication, distribution, and preservation. And we finally had a Facebook group for social updates and kind of a ubiquitous presence in students, uh, in students everyday lives. All of this in addition to the uh, rechristened journaling project, which we called the Documenting Freshman Year Project. Um, so, We'll start with the wiki. Uh, we use the wiki as a hub for hidden history resources with links to the Facebook group, the blog, discussion materials, a calendar. Um, and this really served as a vehicle to allow us actually to conduct a summer assignment um, where we asked students to read Lucille's diary uh, before they arrived on campus. And, uh, and then we asked them to begin a discussion on the wiki before they even showed up for their first day of, uh, of class. And it was actually a huge success. Um, we had actually over a 50% um, return rate on those students before the first day, before they were even students at the university. And the wiki really played a big role in, um, in getting students to hit the ground running. Um, my peers, my peer FAs will talk about, we, have, we send out a welcome letter every summer to tell students, you know, hey, welcome to the university. We're really excited to have you. And um, I think people would be like, man, I only got two students to respond to mine. I got, I got, well, I got three this year. Oh, I'm doing good. And I said, oh, really? You only got three? I'm like, I got 15. And I also got them to start a summer assignment online. Like, so they're already doing work. And people were like, well, what'd you do? And I was like, I just used a wiki and asked them to use it. And so I think that's, that was pretty telling. Um, additionally, the wiki also had, had a great um, effect. Heather, you'd mentioned... Um, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it was fabulous because for any of you who do instruction with students, in some cases, the first time you meet them, you meet them once, you meet them for 50 minutes, and then you never see them again. For me, this was an opportunity to get to know the students, get to know what they thought about not only Lucille, but what they thought about diaries and journaling and their experience with a primary source before they even walked into my classroom. And so then that way, I didn't have to 
find that out and tease that out, I had that and I could start from that point. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point. And then we also used a blog. We mentioned that um, as part of our uh, strategic map and we used a WordPress blog. And this was kind of uh, a part of our folklore component for the FIG. Um, our, it was called Tales of the O and it was a place where students, we asked students to post a short nonfiction story about their first weeks on campus. Um, and stories about getting lost on the way to class, discovering new buildings, um, and talking about what the best eateries on campus. All those stories quickly found their way online, and students were really able to share a slice of their lives outside of the classroom with all the other students, whereas if we had asked them to compile those stories and turn them into us um, to grade, they wouldn't have had been able to read each other's experiences, and really, there's the, there's the whole phenomenon, and we have a screenshot here of the, of the comment. Um, the fantastic comment box as a new form of literature. Um, that, that would never exist if it, if it wasn't hosted online. Um, and so that whole dialogue we think is really valuable. It just wouldn't exist if, it was, if we continue to do it the way that we do. Just to, you know, bust your things out in Microsoft Word and print them, turn it in. So the, the value there is really actually pretty exponential. Um, and so I think students had a lot of uh, fun with this assignment, thinking they were merely being creative, but they were also really leaving a lasting um, digital historical footprint. Um, as well. And finally, Facebook, of course, needs no introduction and it's pretty straightforward. Um, our Facebook group served as a platform for uh, social functions. We hosted events, posted update, updates, excuse me, shared links and photos, um, all in an environment where students were already plugged in. Um, so it got them thinking about class in a new, different way. Um, we also got to do a Facebook assignment um, where in class where we asked students to bring in their laptops break up into groups and use Facebook as a primary source collection, if you will, um, to draw some conclusions about what it meant to be a student at the University of Oregon. Um, we asked students if today's Facebook was the only thing historians 100 years from now had to use as primary source material, what could they learn about what it meant to be a duck at Oregon in 2010? And how might this medium affect the historical understanding for good or bad? And students kind of looked at us and were like, you're allowed to use Facebook for that? And it was, it was really fun. I think we had a good time um, looking through that. And that kind of all culminates in the Documenting Freshman Year Project, which was our, really our central experiential learning project. Um, and this is really where the rubber met the road. Um, instead of using just journals, um, we added a series of options for their autobiography projects every week. Um, that would prompt students to consider what it meant to be a historical actor in the world of new social media. And so students could really, we could still use the written journals, but we also um, asked them, maybe use a blog, try a video blog, what about a podcast, a photography series, a visual series. Really the sky was the limit. Um, and so this is actually the breakdown um, of the media chosen by students. And even though students had a wide variety of choices, the vast majority opted to record their experiences in a written journal, which I thought was a really interesting result, which we'll talk about um, later on. So here are some kind of examples of the, of the work that was made in documenting freshman year, in the Documenting Freshman Year project. Um, we had journals, photos, we had a video, um, some football games, uh, we even had a podcast. We really accumulated all this material by the end of the term, which was really fantastic, and so that on the last day of the class, um, we visited Heather in the University Special Collections and we were ready to donate all of this to her. And we come to donations. So with this class, I see them at the beginning of term, and in the, during the beginning of term is when we sort of set the stage, and we talk about um, what it means to uh, document, what an archivist does. We get to know Lucille. I, give, I show them what the university looked like, what it meant to be a freshman in 1915. And then at the end of the term, they come back. And um, the, one of the things uh, they do, as I tell them, you are the largest group of donors I ever meet with at one time. So I have 25 of them all at once. And that's a key point. This is the opportunity for students to be valued donors to a university archives. And it lets them know that this is not just an exercise. It's not just something that they turn in to Kevin and Matt, but they are actually contributing knowledge to a wider community. As I said, we, we have a very difficult time documenting the student voice, and they are helping to rectify that. As I tell them, I said, we cannot tell the story of this university without you. And at the same time, they also learn about 
the challenges that a university archivist has in documenting that voice. In the time that they've been writing their journals and noticing what they've been doing, they've been able to see issues such as um, different voices, how they come through the university. And in this case, with this year, it was fabulous because I was able to bring up issues of what it means to preserve born digital records and what digital preservation is all about. But I also get to talk with them since they sign a deed of gift, just like all of our other donors do. I get to talk to them about issues of privacy, about issues of uh, copyright. And so it's, it's an early opportunity to make them aware not only of what they're doing and what they're contributing, but what it means to be an actor and creator in a historical realm. From the preservation standpoint, oh, from, <laughs> from the preservation standpoint, for me, and I think for other university archivists, this is where the student content is. It's in the blogs, it's, it's, it's in Facebook. And what I want them to be able to understand is that as students, I need to be able to collect and preserve their digital content. And I hope that all of you who are out there, if, if you're not already doing so, please go talk to your university archivist if you're involved in projects like this. Because if we're not there, this is where we need to be. Also, because in many cases, or in, in all of these cases, these are electronic records, for those of you who are involved in that, you know that you need to be involved in the infrastructure and creating that infrastructure before the records are created and be involved with the creator. And so for me, this is an excellent opportunity to be involved with the students as they're creating their electronic records. What we do for preservation is, is not fancy, but, it, but it, currently it works for us. We have a dark archives on a server, and we have a separate access copy that we uh, provide access to, and I'll show you that in a moment. But then also, as all of us who are archivists now face, this is a blended collection. The, the scrapbook that was mentioned is, is an actual physical scrapbook. So I am currently managing and describing and making available not only the previous two years of paper journals, but also these um, uh, electronic journals and the paper journals that we collected this year. And so in access, what we've done for this collection is to have three access points. Our institutional repository, a finding aid repository, and by a short description in our online catalog. Across the top you can see Scholars Bank is our institutional repository, and the Northwest Digital Archives is our finding aid repository. Um, our Scholars Bank repository has high visibility to uh, Google for uh, both the Scholars Bank and the Northwest Digital Archives, and that's something that is very appealing to all of our students. They love the fact that they'll be able to find their stuff on Google. Um, and right now, we currently use Scholars Bank not only for accessing this particular collection, but we also use it for the access copy for all of the electronic records for university archives. The Northwest Digital Archives is an online repository of traditional archival descriptive tools, or finding aids, for collections. And um, they're used to describe both our paper and our electronic collections. And then finally, our, uh, the listing in the catalog is a traditional collection level description. And so Matt and I want to share with you some of the feedback we had from our students. And we put together uh, a series of questions. And so it's kind of a, a student um, self-assessment that they perform for us at the end of the term. And we wanted to get a sense of what students had learned through the new social media. And the one caveat that I want to identify is the way this particular fig was advertised to students at high school visits and over the summer during introduction leading into the fall of 2009 did not suggest that there would be a new social media 
media aspect to it. And so we, we think that perhaps the profile of students that enrolled in this fig may be different from this coming fall when we've kind of repackaged the marketing and, and the description of the fig. And so that might account for why uh, we had a, maybe a surprising number of students who, who decided to continue in a more traditional format. And so uh, our intended learning outcomes, we've kind of identified those. And so I think what Matt and I are going to do is um, share with you some of the feedback um, from our students to give you an idea of what their previous experience was with uh, new social media. Um, we, we found that it was very limited when it came to blogs and podcasts. There were only uh, two of our 23 students that had uh, written their own blogs before entering the class, only five of the 23 who had read blogs, and for podcasts, a similar number, about four of the 23 had subscribed to a podcast, and only one student who had produced something um, and went on to produce uh, for their project. What we did find, though, of course, very low barriers of, of entry to Facebook, and all uh, of our 23 students had Facebook accounts, and so that was one way to connect with them very easily. So we're just going to briefly go over some of the student answers to the survey that we asked at the end of the term to kind of measure how effective we were. Um, and one of the questions, that, the first question we asked was, was, was the wiki helpful in analyzing that diary? Um, and most students said yes. Uh, 20 out of 23 students said that the wiki was helpful in analyzing um, a primary source. Um, and I think that most students um, enjoyed the summer portion. Um, they don't know what it's, about, what it's like to be a college freshman. Um, and it's you know two weeks until the start of term. And I think a lot of students are actually looking for a way in before um, to hit the ground running. And so I think students said that this was a fantastic opportunity to actually get to meet people before they showed up on the first day of campus. Um, and so definitely that the wiki was helpful um, in kind of um, debriefing uh, a primary source. So that was really an excellent feedback for us, um, which we plan on doing next year. For sure. And, and to Matt's credit, uh, we were very tactful. We didn't want to sh show too much exuberance when students were posting over the summer. We wanted to give them some space of their own to connect, but we also uh, didn't want it to begin to feel like a busy work. And so right. Matt consistently checked in uh, and posted and responded to students throughout the summer, as did I, again, in a way where they weren't feeling overwhelmed in that right. space. But so from the beginning, it would seem like an extension of the community, extension of the dialogue from class into an online environment. And so we were weighing kind of exactly how much to jump in and how frequently. Uh, one of the other questions we asked was whether the communal nature of the tales of the old blog, and these were the, the short nonfiction stories that the students composed about their experiences on their first few weeks on campus, um, how did that affect what they wrote, how they wrote, and did it encourage them to return after their initial posts? Again, kind of getting at that idea if they were starting to see this as an extension of the dialogue from the class. And again, we had a pretty good response rate of about 15, so a majority of our students who uh, were very clear about the reasons why they returned, and not only wanting to read the stories of their peers, but also interested to see if anybody had posted thoughts or responses about the stories they themselves has posed. And what, what I find particularly interesting about this is we really do have three different communities at work in this fig. We have the in-class community, we have the community within the residence hall, and then the online community. And there were different dynamics to each of those. And so it was something we were cognizant of throughout the term is trying to get a sense of how one of those communities was affecting the other. And we could really see online a lot of students being very engaged and, and not perhaps perceiving this as just some, simply kind of checking a box or doing it for a certain number of points. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other things that's really important um, as an FA is to find a way to fill the gray space between two, uh, these two classes, these, these four credit uh, lecture courses. So for us, it's folklore and history. And so um, one of the questions we asked was, was, was the wiki and the blog helpful in making those connections? Um, and on this one, we only got 11 out of 23 students that said that the wiki and the blog was helpful in making a connection between those two courses. Um, I think that also, uh, but there was positive feedback. They said that it was, that it was good, um, and it, they saw um, themes that transcended both classes. Um, but I also think that students don't really think at a meta, at a meta level, um, at a really strategic way to realize, well, what am I doing, and how am I supposed to be seeing things, which is not their fault. Um, so, uh, but it was still, it was, a, it was just one more tool that we had in our toolbox to try and fill that gray space and draw some connections. 
we also wanted to know, again, just a, a similar theme here, if the wiki and blog made their posts, again, feel more like a conversational dialogue, and you can see we can go through this one relatively quickly. It reinforces what we've shared earlier. I, 17 out of 23 students. Um, I, again, I would argue that this goes back to the summer assignment and getting students yeah. connected even before they arrived on campus, and then having Matt, again, living with them in the residence hall. Um, it, I think that online environment was really successful, so we can quickly go on. And this is kind of the same notion. Did the uh, wiki and blog contribute to building another uh, community space? Kevin mentioned the three different separate um, communities. Um, and again, only 12 out of 23. But I think most people identified the fact that because they live together, that was their primary um, avenue of communication, which I thought was really interesting because not all figs are residential. Um, so technology serves as a really great vehicle to try and community build in those more disparate uh, programs. And then the last uh, question we wanted to share with you, uh, which we were really astounded that 21 out of 23 students found this positive. If, if using the wiki and the blog, did they leave the course with an improved understanding of what it means to be both a student of history uh, and a historical actor? And this, again, although our fig was connecting folklore and history, we were both coming from a history background, so we were very encouraged to see this. And again, I, I would argue that th these digital learning environments allowed us to connect students to concepts that can be somewhat challenging for first-year students studying history, concepts of causation, of agency, of authenticity, the, the memory, provenance, these things that historians work with, but can be a bit discreet. And I think by having this reinforced in the different communities, especially the blog and the wiki, students seem to really grasp that. And I think that's by bringing in historiography early and in a way that demystified it. Um, I, I, I found that these online environments really helped us with that because I have certainly teach other first year courses where we don't use and haven't used new social media. And again, those are concepts that are very challenging for students to grasp at first. Okay, so what are some of the implications of, of a model like this? Um, just thinking about the libraries, it's really important to have the enabling technologies in place um, and the service layer to, to help provide the support. Um, we didn't you know, launch our institutional repository because Kevin and Matt started uh, playing around with this idea of getting, or, or Heather, getting um, student work uh, recorded for the archives. We had an institutional repository anyway, and that's been a very solid platform for um, archiving uh, and providing access to digital content like this. So, you know, you have to have those frameworks in place already. Uh, we have a number of media production facilities, the digital repositories. You know, these make it possible for the students to contribute something that lasts and can be shared you know, beyond the, the spatial and temporal, temporal boundaries of the class. Um, and uh, more importantly, I think the, re the partnerships and trust relationships need to be in place. And you know, as I was saying in the introduction, we're a small enough campus. Um, we've been driven to work together uh, for such a long time in, in, in so many different uh, creative ways that these, you know, these conversations occur naturally. So uh, you know, it's, it's been a really positive experience uh, from that regard. But it, but it does require having, um, having a certain amount of uh, programmatic uh, framework already uh, in place. Now the implications for archives, I felt that there were three of them that were hugely important. I mean, the first one was that for the students, this is a contribution to knowledge instead of just classwork. Um, this project has meaning beyond their class, and it lets them feel, and they've told me that they do feel, that this is something that is bigger than just themselves or just their class. And then, I mean, think about it. I mean, how many people would love to have someone come up to, me, to, come up to them and say, what you're doing is so important that I am going to dedicate myself to make sure that it lasts forever. And you're 17, 18 years old. I mean, there, a lot of the students, that actually really resonates with them. The other thing that I think is crucial about this class is the, that, there were, that there are students involved in the course development conversation. From the very beginning, with Connor Ross as uh, the student F FA in the development of the course, and now to Matt Villeneuve and creating and bringing in the Web 2.0 technology into the course, every time this class innovates, it innovates because of the students who, 
who take us there. And then finally, for a, my, the, a huge implication for archives is just to make sure that we are a part of the discussion. And so um, any of you that are out there working in universities, no matter where at the university you are, if there are activities or if you are thinking about activities that will document student life, make sure you talk to your archivist and make them a part of this conversation. Because in some ways we can help not only in finding ways to make this happen, but also in helping to preserve it and make it available. That's what we're here for. And, and just, I'm going to mention two uh, brief implications. I think there are many more than that. The, the first is, again, the skills that students develop by learning history from a textbook are very limited and very different than the skills they would develop when they're analyzing and interpreting primary source materials. And so, on a practical level, new social media provides a platform to deliver and both to analyze in a collaborative way those primary sources. So, for instance, we have, I have students frequently uh, that become very frustrated, even angry, when they're presented with a set of primary source materials that are fragmentary, that are ambiguous, that have contradictory evidence. And again, it's because they've been conditioned to learn cognitively and to think about history from a textbook, which is a very tidy narrative. There's a single author. Everything is very clear. And so they'll often ask me, what do you want me to do with these materials? I mean, I, I can't even read some of it. It's in handwriting. Uh, it doesn't really seem to make sense. And so I tell them, well, you're in the right space if you're frustrated, because that's the work that historians face when they're working in an archive or a special collection or, or interviewing uh, subjects. And so I I, I would argue that the, the digital learning environment provides, on a practical level, we can't always take students to the National Archives. Uh, I would love to, but we can't. But what we can do is we can bring digital pieces of that back and share that in a classroom and set it up in a way that students can be working collaboratively with an instructor, with an FA, in, in analyzing a document online and then discussing it in the classroom. So not just the infrastructure, uh, but also the kind of teaching and learning that takes place. And then secondly, just to give you one example of how uh, media, I think, is, is a, a a direct way to get students to some very challenging concepts of history. So one question that we pose to students in this class is traditionally, if you think about the profile of historical actors who were able to record their experiences and have those remain over time, typically race, gender, ethnicity, class, nationality, citizenship, all play a role in whose voice is preserved, whose voice is not, which voices become marginalized, disremembered over time. And so we're opposing to the students if in a Web 2.0 world there is this sense of kind of an amateur opportunity to create content, does this create a more egalitarian space for the creation and preservation of the voices of historical actors than maybe we've seen traditionally? Or are there certain pitfalls that remain? And so we weren't giving them the answer, but kind of thinking through the kinds of limitations that historians have always space, whether you're reconstructing the past of African-American slaves or if you're reconstructing the past of, of female cannery workers, often those are communities that we have very little manuscript materials left uh, to work with. It doesn't mean we can't research those areas, but it's much more challenging because, again, those voices weren't valued in the way that they are today. And so just kind of asking a, a very fundamental historiographical question of the discipline, I think there's a way to do that within new social media that gets students uh, to that point. And finally, um implications for learning spaces. Um, as an undergraduate teaching assistant, my, what I learned from this experience is twofold. Um, the bottom line is that using technology in the FIG uh, benefited and enhanced the learning of the students. That's what I felt like. That's what they told me. Um, most students and myself um, can really attest that these tools had a really positive impact um, in changing the nature of the assignments that we worked on from being really perfunctory to more conversational. Um, and that was really important. And that's a distinction that I think goes quite, quite a long way towards participation for a first year college student. Um, and yet course requirements really remained the central motivation um, for utilizing that technology. Uh, there was no real um, organic or grassroots desire to use the new media. Um, that really didn't arise from the group. Just because we were talking about blogs, then there wasn't a large contingent of students that got inspired to go use them. Um, on some of those questions we asked, did you return to your assignments? We, we, those people who said yes said, you know, yes, I did because I wanted to see what my peers said, which was great and fantastic. Others just said, well, I thought it was part of my grade, so I'll do whatever I have to do to get, you know, get the grade, um, which isn't exactly what we're going for. But um, 
But at the end of the day, uh, I can confidently say again that the, the, the experience was a positive one um, and we'll definitely plan on doing it uh, in the future. And speaking of the future, um, we have a couple of notes for what we plan to do next fall with considerations that we've made. Um, part of all of us have discussed and kind of contributed. Um, I would say that we have a new angle being this, this technology piece and how social media might change the study of history, which we talked about at length. We have some new marketing that's a little more colorful. You can see our old, our old uh, marketing materials is kind of this gray sepia tone picture with the Lucille Saunders who wrote the diary. Fantastic, interesting to me, doesn't look the most popping off the page, really interactive um, kind of thing that we're trying to teach and convey. Um, so now we have this whole dichotomy of the, of the past and the future, and it's a little more colorful on our blog. And hopefully that will attract some students that we think um, are, will be more uh, conditioned in the, in the world of social media. Mm -hmm. And we're also hoping, and, and I think we plan on doing, having students not only work with Lucille Saunders' diary next year, and it's all about scaffolding, so the kind of increasing the level of complexity of the primary sources that students are presented with when they're researching, and, and having students go back and work with the previous cohort's materials that they've donated to Heather, both the written materials and the digital materials. And as Matt mentioned, and Heather both, the, the, the digital capturing um, was able to preserve an aspect that wasn't there when they were just donating their their journal projects because we have those wonderful conversations of the students on the blog and the wiki right. and so we were able to mm -hmm. capture a larger experience of the class and so we're gonna have students think about working through those as another form of primary source in addition to Lucille's diary and I think we have enough of it now that that it's a rich enough collection that it can be a fairly um, engaging opportunity for students to, to do the diary and then move on to the previous students so. Um, we've had a lot of interest on campus lately in uh, coming up with a, uh, a community blogging platform, probably something like a WordPress multi-user instance or possibly Drupal um, you know, that would help support uh, projects like this. There are a number of other uh, initiatives on campus. Uh, student Life has something underway where they're talking about um, integrating all kinds of, um, of life skills and have the students reflect on those. So there's a portfolio uh, potential. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with you know, Jim Groom's work at um, University of Mary Washington uh, with, with e -port using WordPress for ePortfolios. So we may be exploring something like that. Um, and you know, having a, a more consistent uh, campus solution could be really helpful for when it comes time for Heather to start to, to harvest, um, especially if this grows. Um, you know, scale is certainly an issue. I mean, we're, you know, uh, this particular fig has 25 students, and um, there's there's interest now in, in pushing the model out to many, many more uh, more sections. So, uh, at the same time, I mean, as, as much as that might help, uh, you know, facilitate the process, we we need to be careful that the systems don't compromise the student sense of ownership and their capacity for personal expression and reflection and you know of course this is something we hear about a lot with blackboard um, or you know other standard you know course management systems like that is that just to, it's just not where i want to be it's too administrative and it goes away at the end of the term um, so that um, there are some problems people have with using a tool like that to do something that's as potentially open-ended as uh, uh, a hidden history fig. So I think that brings us to the end of our, our slides. I think we have just a couple minutes left um, to take questions, but we can certainly uh, uh, hang around up here for a few extra minutes, too, if you're interested. So if you do have questions, please step to one of the microphones, because the uh, session's being recorded, and that'll, that'll get your question. Hi, uh, I think this is a really creative partnership and I think it's, it's a wonderful uh, project that you're doing and I was thinking about scale as you were talking about it. It's not only scale of students, it's what are the faculty, how are you promoting the adoption of these technologies with the rest of the faculty so they can start to think of creative partnerships as well. I think, uh, why don't you take a shot at that, Kevin? Uh, it's a yeah. great question. We, we have about, um, you know, 65 to 70 faculty who participate in the FIG program in a given year. And 
Um, there, other than the incentive of working with first year students, there's not a lot. There's maybe a little course buyout, but it certainly doesn't connect to tenureship or promotion or any of those considerations. And I, I think the why faculty are excited about it, it's an opportunity to teach to their passions, and they often have colleagues in, a, in a, another discipline who they would like to connect through the class. And so I think the challenge would be to, to um, have a model that doesn't feel like it's being imposed on faculty who are maybe reticent or haven't thought through the pedagogical reasons to use the technology. Um, and But we have a wonderful uh, provost, uh, vice provost of undergraduate studies uh, and a director of first year programs that does a wonderful job identifying faculty who are interested in this and allowing faculty to really be creative with how they, their design of that one credit seminar. So I could see uh, this being introduced. Matt has been asked to be one of the uh, FA instructors. They, they train their new teaching assistants each year. And so I think gradually, maybe it's from the bottom up, uh, it'll be the, the FA is going to faculty and saying, hey, here's some great ways we can use this technology. Uh, but certainly those conversations are happening at a higher level, too, between some of our administrators and the faculty. Well, uh, the, ne the next time we give this talk uh, will be for the campus's undergraduate council, which is a group of administrators and, and faculty and students, including Matt this year, um, who uh, oversee uh, in a participative way the undergraduate education program on campus. So there's a lot of interest in this from, from many sectors. You know, the other um, sort of incremental um, change that's coming along, um, as I understand it, the summer, there will be a summer component now for all the figs. Um, I don't think there's a, a fixed technology that's required to, uh, to do that, but you know, based on, largely on the success of, of Matt's uh, students in connecting with Lucille's diary before they arrived on campus, uh, all the other figs are going to be having something that brings the, the students and the FA and, and the faculty together. And I would just jump in and say that there are a lot of faculty, not only on our campus, but across the country, who are kind of rethinking broader questions about undergraduate education, particularly the purpose and the role of a large survey lecture. Uh, and if it's not about simply delivering content, and for history, it's certainly not, and we're, we're looking for ways to engage students in that process of interpreting primary sources and then scholarly writing, ex expository writing about those sources. Difficult to do in a class of two or 300 students, even if they're meeting in, in small discussion sections once through, once a week with the graduate teaching fellow. And so I know separate even from the one credit seminar, many faculty are exploring ways. We have Blackboard as our course management system at the UVO, but I know we're considering adopting some others uh, where folks are trying to think about digital environments where small groups within those large lecture surveys can engage maybe the same set of primary sources or different sets of primary sources and have conversations existing online that could then be evaluated either by the instructor or a GTF to kind of extend that classroom environment. So I, I think there's a, a broader question about how to maybe reform fundamentally the, the large lecture survey um, in some of the humanities disciplines at the UVO, and I could see that being an incentive uh, to use something like a FIG as, as one kind of inroad to that mm -hmm. broader goal. More questions? Great, thank you. As a historian, I found this fascinating, but um, one thing about the technology, if I, when I work with paper do documents, I can trace change, concept of draft, Diaries and letters often show mm -hmm. thinking. John, does your technology? Do you have a method of, of? Are the students asked to preserve drafts? Do they go back and rework material on reflection? And how do they, in fact, how do you capture in this material the sort of? Well, gee, if you think about it a week later, or you have an intended audience, so you change what you write when you think about it in terms of letters. Oh, those are all excellent questions, and that, that's one of the ongoing conversations we have about how, how is posting on a blog or a wiki that's available only to your peers or that's available to the universe, how is that affecting what it is you're writing, what you're leaving out, um, and so that's an intentional conversation we've had. The question about though capturing kind of the, the marginalia and then the comments and the drafts, um, we're, I know we're looking at incorporating, is it, is it comment now or now comment or one of the platforms? Um, that's, that I think that's one of, one of the, uh, the plugins. For, for WordPress. We're trying to find kind of a collaborative yeah. space where mm -hmm. folks can co-construct or work on a document that would capture kind of the track changes of those elements. We weren't able to do that this last year, but that's something that we certainly would like to be able to do because you're right, there's a lot of rich learning uh, that takes place that wouldn't be captured um, in, in that case. So I know that's something we have on our agenda to, to look at what platform would be, and well, probably Andrew and, or yeah. others are much the, more knowledgeable, but as a story, and that's something that I've been concerned about well, as well. Well, the wiki would be another option for that right. because wikis right. track, um, track versions. 
So um, if you had enough accounts, you'd, you'd, to do it right though, you'd really need to have individual accounts sort of feeding together, which, which is one of the reasons I, I find the, the WordPress multi-user model fairly compelling, is that each individual student can have their own site or as many sites as they want, um, and then the instructor and the FA can, can harvest what they need from those sites uh, with, with RSS feeds or tags. Um, so th that way the student has a much more personal learning environment that they can apply to a lot of classes, just the way you might take notes in more than one, uh, one thing in the same notebook. Um, you don't, I don't know how people organize their, their notebooks, but I have one little sort of moleskin type notebook and I take notes on everything in that. So I don't have a separate one for each meeting that I attend or I'd have a stack of them. So, <laughs> so I think we're probably getting pretty close to the, to the end of our time, but we'd be happy to um, entertain a few more questions up here in the front. So, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>